Hello, my name is Joe Mershman, and we're here today with Turk Riganator, Ben Peeper, and Tommy Johns. And we're starting a new uh, video blog that we'll put out once a week that will talk about at least three topics that may affect you or your businesses or your farms. So today is our first one. So, Turk, what did you find this past week that caught your interest? Well, obviously, the, the big news this week was the EPA announcement on dicamba uh, and the future of uh, 2019 spray requirements. Um, you know, there's some changes, 45 days uh, from after planning. Uh, you also, um, the, the, probably the biggest thing, I think, is going to be the requirement that all applicators have to be certified, cannot be under the direct supervision of anyone. So that is going to be a big problem for the uh, for the uh, retailers to be able to meet that requirement. I believe that 45 day. You're talking from planting to spray. You have to be finished spraying 45 days after you plant. After you plant, or up to R1, I believe, is what the label is going to say. There's still a lot of confusion about about the requirements and what they what they mean. There's going to be a lot of answers in the next few weeks, but uh, I think. Uh, I think those are the big things, and then the other the other uh, issue that we've got to deal with is when it comes to um, uh, this decision in Dicamba, is we still have a court ruling out in uh, Ninth Circuit Court that has to be settled, and and that's that's the one that probably can throw a monkey wrench to this whole thing real quick. Isn't that the court ruling where the Certain groups are saying that the whole process to approve dicamba was there was a mistake made. In other words, they didn't use the proper s steps to approve the herbicide in general to begin with. The 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 uh, plaintiffs are saying that EPA did not um, use um, industry standards to uh, to prove the environmental impact. They use all statements from Monsanto, and that's their complaint. And the, and the, the lower court uh, threw it out, I believe, and it went to the Ninth Circuit Court Appeals Court, and they have heard the case, and they are not real happy with EPA at this time, but they have not made the ruling. So we have to wait and see what that ruling is going to be, because what the plaintiff they're asking for is that the dicamba registration be invalidated completely. Wow. So if that happens, we're back to square one on dicamba registration. So that's a big ruling. We'll have to wait and see what that does. Uh, and they could, or they could just ask for uh, for some more clarification. But this is the same court that put uh, Roundup Ready Alpha Alpha on hold for four years, asking for an environmental impact study that took four years to complete. So sure. it it's a big deal. Turk, what's up with the 57-foot border around the endangered species? Well, again, that's another thing that's kind of up in the air. And what what is that um, that border pertain to? Endangered species, uh, um, plant, or plant, plant, uh, endangered plants. So, uh, again, we need more interpretation on on what that's going to be, and actually on on where it's going to be. Is it going to be around the entire field regardless or is it just going to be uh, up up next to uh, uh, where those plants are? So uh, endangered species is one thing, but then the other thing is the uh, is the uh, susceptible plants, which would be Roundup, uh, non-GMO, and, and in Mama's Garden and sure. everything else. So, so the 120 foot, 110, 110 foot, foot, excuse me, Buffer still in place for the downwind, downwind to a sensitive crop. That's still that's still in play all the time. And then they're now they're talking about 57 feet, in addition around the other three corners of that field potentially, depending upon how that's interpreted. That's correct. And so uh, it's my it's my understanding that regardless of what direction the wind's blowing, that border cannot be sprayed. Also, which is again, what are you going to do for? those that part of the field yeah it could be a lot of a lot of weeds uh, that could cost a lot of yield well the bottom line is you can see you know we've we've read this you know basically what we've seen we have a lot of questions and i'm sure you do too so that might make good reason if you're in eastern iowa or western illinois to attend one of our 
meetings that we've got coming up in Burlington and also in uh, Cedar Rapids with Dr. Jason Norsworthy, which I'm sure he'll have the answers uh, for these questions as well as any other questions on herbicides. If you haven't heard about that, you can go to our website, uh, www.immersionmentseeds.com and find out about that particular meeting. But we're purposely bringing him up to, to get the facts uh, to our customers and to, to farmers and, and any interested party. It's open to the public. The thing that I really appreciate about Jason, I think that's going to be really valuable for that meeting, is that he cares just like us, cares a lot about the farmer, wants to do right by the farmer, and, and he gives his really unbiased opinion. And that's what's probably the most important idea of our meeting is that it's not sponsored by a chemical company. And we feel that we've brought one of the premier weed scientists in to answer as many questions and uh, clear up as much confusion as possible. So. That's, that's November 19th. Watch for yeah. postcards. Go to our website to, to check it out if you'd like to attend this meeting. It's going to talk about all the herbicide traits. In fact, we've, we call it the great uh, trait debate. The great trait debate, yeah. And I talked to uh, Pam this morning, and she said that the room was filling up quite a bit. So... Uh, Limited spaces available in that meeting. So. Well, Jason uh, uh, has been doing research on all the different herbicides and modes of action to uh, control uh, resistant weeds for for years, and uh, so he has more research than than anybody I've ever seen, and and all the information that it's going to take to uh, uh, present. So, okay. yeah, he he heads up. He's a weed scientist from the University of Arkansas. Why we brought him up is because Arkansas is a really, really tough state to control Palmer and some of the tough weeds that we're just starting to find out about up here. So he's a great resource. Uh, we got some great weed scientists at Iowa State University and also University of Illinois, and, and we, we work with those folks too. But we thought we'd bring somebody uh, with a slightly different uh, opinion based on some of the tough conditions that they have down in Arkansas. Sure. Yeah. So. Anything else, Turk, that you'd like to add about that? That's a big topic. I mean, that's one that affects whether you're growing extend soybeans or if you're growing uh, conventionals, LibriLink, LibriLink GT27, and potentially, hopefully, uh, in, uh, get approval of the Enlist E3. So uh, I, I hope the I hope this ruling in um, in uh, Oregon or uh, that's that's up there. It's actually a Seattle uh, court case, but I, I hope this ruling comes back that it doesn't eliminate. Uh, dicamba. but we need that we need that technology I think that we just need to keep it under control somehow good point I agree. Ben what do you have today today one of the biggest things that I've been dealing with in the past week is uh, about soybean damage and the possibility of what we're seeing um, once these farmers are hauling their uh, their uh, soybeans into the elevator so just to give a little bit of an agronomy background and update what we're dealing with here is the uh, um, it's a Phomopsis uh, stem and uh, it's a uh, called Phomopsis uh, pod and stem blight complex. So there's like three or four different diseases that work together, and uh, given the right environmental conditions, the pod and stem blight and the Phomopsis all work together to uh, impact our soybean yields. So we're seeing the most damage come from the areas that were ready to harvest before our little monsoon season came in, mm -hmm. where we had three inches of rain. Mm -hmm. So. The soybeans are ready to harvest, and this is just the trend that I've been seeing specifically and talking to some other agronomists, they're seeing the same thing as well. The, uh, the, the soybean fields are ready to harvest three weeks ago, and the guys were still working on corn. They got rained on. The pod and stem blight absolutely exploded. You'll start to see the uh, sclerotia climb up the stem of the plant. You'll start to see black blotching on the pods. And then once that happens, the Phomopsis has the availability to go into the pod itself create like a wispy white fungus starting around the, the plant. And once you see that, that is your first indication of that, that cloudy spider web style um, web around the uh, actual seed itself. Once that happens, you need to be getting into the soybean field and picking because if you continue to have high humidity situations, the, uh, the, uh, the, the decay starts very rapidly and quickly. And that affects us on two different levels. We have damage percentages at the elevator and then that affects us with our, our seed production as well. And I think Joe's got a couple notes on, on what we're doing to make sure that we don't have dead seeds or uh, low germs because of this Phomopsis because we are bringing in soybeans at this point in time that you know could potential have the, this pod and stem blight and maybe a good reason by, why not to be uh, planting uh, untreated seed for this coming year. Right? All right. No question about it. This is not the year to plant untreated seed. Because like Ben talked about, you know, the pod and stem blight starts on the outside of the plant, 
and then penetrates the pod wall when you get a lot of water, a lot of rain, when soybeans are ready to harvest and you can't get out there and get them. And we've had a lot of that this year. So then what it does is it infects the seed. Well, fortunately, uh, the Mercerman Bonus Coated Plus soybean treatment system has a product in it that is death on pod and stem blight. In other words, it's a seed scrubber or sterilant that will wipe out any of the pod and stem blight that's on the seed surface, and your seed will then grow normally. So uh, if you don't have treated seed, and particularly have this particular component uh, in your seed treatment that will sterilize the seed, you could potentially have uh, poor germination and poor emergence. So we want to give everybody a heads up to that. And obviously we're, uh, uh, we know when our soybeans have been harvested, we know which bins have been before the rains, which ones are after. We're taking extra diligence to make sure we put out a very high quality product. But this is going to be a challenging year for seed quality uh, for, for most companies that, you know, because it affected everything from uh, east, to, east to west and north to south. So um, give you a heads up on that. Definitely want to plant treated seed this year. Because if not, uh, you could be disappointed in your stand. That's correct. Tommy, what do you have? Uh, Joe, I, I really had uh, just a little bit of a harvest update. Um, looks like as far as the Mid-South is concerned, uh, corn's kind of getting finished up. Um, we're still about uh, 70, we're about 50% on corn production uh, harvested in the state of Iowa, um, compared to about 63% in the rest of the United States. Uh, and then also in Iowa, we're about 75% done with soybeans, and that's compared to about pretty equal to what the United States average is right now at 70, 70%. Um, it's just been a really tough year with, with harvest, especially in, in, in Iowa in that, in that um, central south part of the state, you know, south of Des Moines. It's been hot and dry and, and wet and cold all all they had about the 15 inches of rain over there, didn't they? Don? Yeah, yeah. It's been been and it's it's been a slow start. You know, I know there's certain areas in that Indianola area where they've had heavy rains for planting. They've had hail throughout the year, and then they're they're dealing with rain and a slow harvest right now. So, uh, you know, as far as um, as far as my subject, I just really wanted to just talk about is that you know harvest is a tough year. Uh, this year is a tough year for harvest anyway, and uh, farmers are really trying to do their best. And and you get a chance to thank a farmer for for what he does with all the work they put in, the time. Um, try to go out there and give a, limb, uh, give a handshake to them and let them know how much you appreciate it, so. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a real challenge. And of course, uh, yesterday, uh, we're recording this on Friday, uh, we had a uh, really good uh, movement in the markets in soybeans yeah. uh, because, uh, you know, there's a little, uh, President Trump uh, uh, tweeted, uh, you know, some positive discussion potentially coming up with the Chinese to get this trade war squared away. And I think once we get that behind us, I think we're gonna see some positive things in the soybean prices. Yep. So it's not all doom and gloom, sure. but uh, you know, we just know that uh, it's our job to do the best, to give you all the information so you can make the best decisions, and that's what we're trying to do. Exactly right. Well, some of the other good news, Ben, is uh, we've had excellent yields in yeah. spite oh, of all this. Oh, absolutely, yep. And some of these damage percentages that we're seeing, you know, I see a range from the customers that I get to talk to, I see a range from 2% damage all the way up to 40% to damage, but that's not really affecting the yield on what they're seeing. You know, it's still, beans are yielding in the mid-60s, mid-70s is kind of our most common range of what we're seeing here in southeast Iowa. So. It's a, we're, we're seeing good yields and excellent yields in some spots where the, the rain fell late. So um, I'm, it's, it's definitely not all doom and gloom. There's definitely good news out there. Just try to stay positive. That's all we can do. Yep. So. Well, we hope this, you find this valuable, and we'll continue to do this weekly. And uh, if you have any questions, you can sure email us, call us, text us, whatever it takes. Uh, we're available to answer any specific questions. And we thank you for watching today. In